and welcome to This is Metal with Joe Lawson. I'm Jason J. Rockhead, uh, Houston, and our special guest today is uh, guitarist Rusty Cooley. How you doing today, Rusty? Oh, man, I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? And I got to thank our, our mutual friend Joe here. Um, he's the one that set this up. Apparently, you and Joe know each other. So, Joe, why didn't you start the interview off? Tell us how you and Rusty know each other. Well, um, I was referred to Rusty uh, from a, a mutual contact, Carlos Zima. Um, Rusty played in a, an amazing band called Outworld with him. And I was looking for uh, some shredder guitar players to do some work with uh, on our last Scream King album. And he referred us to Rusty. And after looking at Rusty's work and listening to some of the stuff that he that he's done, Rusty is now one of my favorite guitar players. Dude, thank you. That's awesome. Appreciate that. Man. And and so, what was that experience like um, getting to um, appear on the Scream Kings album for you, Rusty? That was cool, man. You know, I was uh, <clears throat> I was a little technology or technologically challenged at the time because I was just learning how to, you know, I got a Logic Pro and was just learning how to do all that stuff. So, you know, I was up against the wall with that stuff, but the playing was was fun. It was great, you know. Yeah, and, and you know, Rusty, um, I went on your official website to prep for today's interview, and I was reading that um, years ago, and this takes me back, um, that you, when you were first starting out, learning how to play the guitar, you actually took um, lessons from um, Doug Mark's Metal Method, which I remember seeing ads for for that um, back in the day in Circus Magazines and Hip Raider and Metal Edge. So talk a little bit about that. Sure, man. Um, it's funny that you mentioned Circus and Hip Raider, man. Talk about it. Blast from the past. That's where yeah. I saw the ad. Um, I saw the ad in the magazine, and then a buddy of mine had been carrying it around in his wallet. And I was like, dude, if you're not going to use that, give it to me. And I, yeah. I took it <laughs> the first two lessons. And, you know, and, you know, you got to keep remember the times, right? So this comes in a, you know, you can't, got a book and a cassette in a little brown envelope that came in the mail, all discreet and shit, you know? <laughs> it's just kind of yeah. funny. But it was it was great, man. I I had tried lessons before Metal Method when I first when I got my first guitar. My mom signed me up for guitar lessons at you know the guitar shop that I got my guitar at, and I took one month there. And after the first month, the, my guitar instructor said, "I can't teach this kid. He's not doing you know learning anything." But you know, I was fifteen, and he was teaching me like Mel Bay Book One and open chords. It's like I'd come in every week and go, "Hey, man, check out this Van Halen riff my friend showed me." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So he said, that, you know, suggested one of his buddies that I take lessons from him. And I took like two lessons from him and it was the same thing. And I quit. And uh, when I got the, I ordered Doug Marks' two, first two lessons, Metal Gear and uh, Metal Primer. And it was like taking guitar lessons from a rock star. He was playing with the exact tone and stuff that I liked. And, you know, he was telling me all the things that I needed to hear for what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? And not only was, was Doug a, a really good guitar instructor, I mean, you know, I think he's a great guitar instructor, but he's a great motivational guy. You know what I mean, he, he always talked about, you know, Zig Ziglar and some other dudes like that. And, you know, how his dad would, if, if he wanted something when he was a kid, I think this is how the story goes. His dad would say, okay, you got to read this book first, you know, and then and it was always a motivational book or whatever. And so I've been into that sort of stuff, you know, since I was a teenager and it really helps, um, you know, just a positive attitude and keeping your head in the right place. And then, Dude, it's like Doug Marks. It was, you know, so I'm, I'm sure, you know, since you took those guitar lessons that you must have um, had some interaction or contact with Doug Marks. Um. Yeah, um, I would say around the time Outworld's first album was coming out, we had spoke and he started using a quote from mine. He found a quote, quote of, uh, where I'd said something about Metal Method in, in uh, an interview. So he started putting that quote in his Metal Method ads. So wow. That was cool, yeah. You know, That's awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool to come full cycle, you know what I mean, from a beginner, because that's what I was, a complete beginner. I remember, check this out, I remember I was in high school, when I started my freshman year, I went to this party, and, and all these, all the older dudes there, you know, high school kids were playing guitar, and I played a little bit, and I wasn't very good, because I just had got my guitar about, you know, two months, three months before that, and uh, and they, I told them about Metal Method, and they were all laughing at me and shit, and uh, <laughs> when I went back to school the next year, I was kicking everybody's ass. Like huh, Doug Mark's real funny, huh? Now, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, Who's laughing laugh, now? <laughs> but he was really ahead of his times, and it's amazing that um, the way Metal Method took off because you know he kind of had to put his own musical career on the side because that just took off. Yeah, yeah, he did end up. Uh, he he put out an album with his band Hawk, and uh, 
he ended up he had some pretty he had some pretty famous guys or guys that went on to be in some pretty famous bands that storm for one i know yeah 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 and i think it was there's an uh I think lonnie was, vincent i think from the bullet boys yeah something something like that yeah so he had a pretty cool lineup and you know he he had this thing called the metal message it was like a newsletter that came out every so many months and um his wife at the time had this thing in the back of it where it talked about stage presence and um you know how to dress making your own rock clothes and shit you remember you gotta remember it's the 80s yeah yeah so you know but it was pretty cool man it was as a kid it was super inspiring man i would i had a cassette player that would when you put the cassette in it would loop it both sides oh, and over again and yeah, I would, that's awesome i'd go to sleep with my headphones on it would loop over and over all night long, yeah. long I, I would take those little booklets to school i'd sit in the back of the class and stick them inside my regular books and act like i was studying and shit yeah all metal method man and i know um that he's had other players um you know make um lessons um in addition to him doing it um were you ever asked to um yeah we talked about it um but again it was one of those things where i was technologically challenged it was you know you need to be able to do all this stuff and it's like man i'm pretty old school when it comes to i just signed up to play guitar man that, that, that's amazing to hear rusty cooley say he's mm -hmm. technologically uh, you know yeah, you know i mean it's challenged. Like, you know, I, when he offered me the the opportunity to, to do that, it was way before the technology that we have now. Oh, sure. You'd have a handheld camcorder and you had to try to set up and get, get good lighting and all that stuff. And it's not like you could just get on Amazon or whatever and order this, you know, green screen or lighting kit that you pull yeah. down behind you. So for me, it was, it was, it was like, dude, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. And, 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 and what are your thoughts on kids learning guitar and, you know, other instruments like via YouTube videos and stuff? Well, I mean, here's the here's the problem with it. If you're a beginner, you don't know what's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anybody that's better than you when you're a beginner must know what they're doing. Sure, sure. Yeah. And th these guys, they they might just be one page ahead of you in the book, right? Right. I mean, I can't see how many times I've had guys that have started to learn guitar on YouTube then come to me for lessons, and I would spend the next year correcting all the stuff they learned wrong. Wow, wow. You know what I mean? So. Now, when you get a little bit better and you know who the what players to look at, then then you can get a lot out of it. I mean, when I was a kid, if I could have jumped on YouTube and you know watched Ingve Malmsteen teach something or Paul Gilbert, yeah, 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 Jason Becker, dude, I would have been all over it, man. It would have been great. That was unheard of. You could, it was not possible to do that. Yeah, I mean, Jason Becker, you mentioned. I, I mean, he's um, he's just amazing at what what he does. I mean, when you when you consider that you know he's had this disease when. Since he was like 19 or 20 years old and it's got gone progressively worse a lot of people would have put down the guitar and quit playing but he's gone the extra mile him and his father they created this computer where he uses a computer and he looks at it somehow and it yeah, it's, they, creates they, the music they, it's just amazing right but they created a way to communicate via eye movement yeah yeah alphabet and um i was on a on a round table interview with it was uh me and jason becker jeff loomis richie Cotson and um i forgot who else was on it but but jason was on there and his dad was obviously speaking for him and he was just cracking jokes the whole time it was, it was hilarious telling stories about when him and richie Cosson were. that's awesome right talking about rich uh that's jason, inspiring yeah jason said he goes mike barney i don't know what he was thinking to put me and Jay, uh, richie Cosson in a studio together and then give us a motel room because we were in there i'm surprised we got anything done you know <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah so yeah. that's awesome so, see, yeah He's always been very upbeat and uh, very positive, and it's, it's really amazing. You know, most people with ALS, you know, have about a six to seven year lifespan, and he's lived, you know, I don't know, up at least 20 years with it or more. I'm not sure about the date on it, but it's been a long time. So that says wow. a lot about his attitude, his mental attitude, where his head's at, and the support he gets from his family, you know. So, oh, wow. It can make a huge difference. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Well. My biggest guitar heroes, you know. I mean, I'm oh sure. I mean, I mean, I mean, he because um, I mean, you just consider uh, his his health issues and stuff. In fact, that he's able to do what he's done. I mean, it's kind of you know Rick Allen, the one armed drummer. I mean, even that um, really changed the way um, you know technology and stuff, the way people can play drums. Sure. Yeah, and Jason's composing all of that stuff via you know, just eye movement. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, so that, that time. <laughs> you know yeah, I, mean? I seen a video, Rusty, um, for enter entertained by pain for um, I guess you're part of his band, Day of Reckoning. Talk a little bit about that. Correct. Sure, man. Day of Reckoning. 
this is what I did um, after Outworld broke up. Um, when I was in Outworld, you know, I started listening to heavier stuff because it was kind of in a weird time. We were still in the middle of that whole era of guitar solos weren't cool mm -hmm. sort of thing, right? So there weren't really any bands putting out anything I liked, so I had to start listening to other stuff. So I was able to find some inspiration in some heavier music. Um, I started listening to like Meshuga and Arch Enemy and Lamb of God and stuff like that. And when I first started listening to that stuff, I used to hate those kind of vocals. You know, I just, I wanted to hear somebody sing, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd started out and I could get maybe through one or two songs and then maybe three songs. And then I finally kind of got over it. And when you, when you listen to it, um, you can actually, there's actually guys that are good at that kind of vocals. And sure, sure. you begin to, to be able to tell the difference when you develop a palate for it. But backing up a little bit, the thing that attracted me to that music so much was the, the killer guitar riffs and the drums, man. The, they were kicking. Even if they didn't have like super amazing solos or anything like that, um, not to say they didn't, but the, the songs and the riffs were so cool. And that was, so I started getting heavier, right? And this is leading right. up, right? So when Outworld broke up, I decided to just go ahead and fully explore that, that option. So, you know, that's what Day of Reckoning is. Two guitars, you know, um, no keyboards, um, different style vocals. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, might as well try it. If it doesn't work, I'll do something else. And so um, is, is it um, all you like doing everything or is there? Well, no, w w there's a there's a band behind it. But I mean, I, I, I write all the music. I don't write the vocals or the lyrics, um, but I write the riffs and stuff and, and, and arrange it. And uh, for the most part, I mean, I co-arrange some of this stuff with the guys. It's like I'll write the riffs and then bring them into rehearsal and we'll just start throwing them around. And, and are, are you working towards like a, maybe a full length or even an EP? Well, we have two EPs out. Oh, wow. OK, I wasn't even aware. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, 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 man. Yeah, there's two Day of Reckoning EPs. There's Into the Fire Part One, and then there's Spread Your Disease, which that's the one that um, Entertained by Pain is on. And that album, that EP, we released it about two weeks before COVID hit. And wow. Like, yeah. Could either sync or go viral with a name like a title yeah. like Spread Your Disease, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Have you guys played out live at all? Have you done any live shows, or is there plans to do that? We've played. We've been we've been playing live since I don't know twenty. 12 something like that yeah i think that's about right 2012 20 yeah 2012 at least we started playing live and uh, we just haven't done anything since covid we don't have a drummer and a bass player and it's like you know man it's, it's hard to find guys and, and sure. i don't you know for us to go out and tour i mean we've done touring with with like a temporary drummer you know a fill-in guy that would just go out on the road with us but it's like you know without a a, a, a bare minimum a drummer here it makes it really difficult um I've been, I've been, I have superior drummer on my computer and I've been trying to learn how to use that better. Um, I mean, I programmed, uh, you know, when I was demoing out my instrumental album, I programmed most of the drums for that. Now, um, you know, so I know how to write drum parts, but it's, it's different with this thing, superior drummer. Um, but, you know, I'm starting to get- and Of course, they're two different entities, but do you, do you have a preference? Like, um, do you prefer uh, working with a group of guys as opposed to doing everything on your own? Oh man, I would much rather be in the rehearsal room. Some of my best stuff comes when I'm in the rehearsal room jamming with the drummer. You know yeah. what I mean? Stuff I would never have written if it wouldn't have been in that environment. So I love that. You just feed off uh, the musicians you're playing with and yeah. you know, some of the best stuff. I mean, that song off Outworld's uh, first album, War Cry, that song was a total goof. You know, it ended yeah. up being one of the best songs on the album. And what I mean by that was around that time, I was listening to Halford's Resurrection album. And the song Resurrection, Halford sings this really high stuff. Yeah. Rehearsal one night goofing off and I yelled at Kelly. I said, sing something like Halford on this riff. And that that little thing turned into, you know, Warcry. Wow, wow. You know, um, the song Left to Fire. Nice. So, yeah, yeah, right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of energy you get off playing with other people. You know, um, that there's a song off Day of Reckoning's first uh, EP called Left to Follow. That was another thing that just came together in rehearsal one night. I you know, started jamming some riffs and me and the drummer just took off and it was done, you know. If I'm at home with superior drummer or whatever, and I'm like trying to, oh, me, you know, hunt and peck and try to write drums, it's like, dude, I play guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and so, Joe, yeah, is there anything yeah. you want to ask, Rusty? Yeah. Um, besides Day of Reckoning, are you doing anything else? To, uh, what What else you got going on, Rusty? Um, the most recent thing that I did was with um, this violinist, pianist, composer Christy Craig. We just released a, a song and video called Antipathy, and you can see it. Um, cool. 
whatnot. It's really cool, man. It's Christy writes uh, all this very classical music. It's um, it's hard to describe. It's not like traditional classical, but it's it's almost like stuff you would hear in a film score, right? And it's got this oh, nice kind of an edginess to it, and it's got you know it's got a lot of dynamics. You know, it's it's it's. I think it's got a place. There's a place for it out there for sure. So that's the most recent thing that I've done. Um, aside from just guest solos and, and stuff like that, uh, I've been working. I've That's been, cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Stuff. Nice. So you're look. Uh, so are you looking for a full time drummer for Day of Reckoning? That would be great. I would love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how close are you to like uh, Houston area? Uh, I mean, I'm sitting in Houston right now. So okay. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right in the neck of the. Right in the middle of Houston. Right in the neck of the woods of uh, James and the guys from Hellstar, too, right? Yes. Yeah, who, who are you thinking of? Okay. Okay, okay yeah. Who are you thinking of? We're uh, going to be talking to James soon. Uh, James is a good friend of mine and Larry from Hellstar. Yep, um, um, maybe they can help out or maybe they know someone. They've, they've been in that area for a long time. Yeah, man, it's 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 not easy, dude. But uh, I, No, it's not. It's, it's, it's a struggle to find... Uh, reliable and talented musicians it's, yeah, it's it really earlier, is you know earlier this year guys i got a chance to interview larry and um i was interviewing him because he's in this other band called santa ocha or something like that it's a spanish metal band yeah, yeah. yep yeah pretty pretty cool yeah, yeah. awesome is it pretty new yeah 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 well i think they've been around for they, they put out like maybe two or three albums but yeah they've had it going for the last several years okay. and, and, and it, it's interesting it's an interesting um experience because you're listening to music you know the, the vocals are in spanish and so can't really understand really even what the the song is about or what the lyrics are but interestingly enough the metal was you know the music was just so heavy and even though i couldn't understand what i was really listening to it, it i liked it anyways just just see i guess the aggressiveness and yeah. just the music kind of stood out on it. its own you know which is a unique experience it's kind of like rammstein i don't understand german but this music is you know, it's good enough, man. It's a universal language, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it really is. I mean, that 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 right there shows you that um, music, if it's if it's um, of any quality, that it can really unite people. Sure, and, and even if the the lyrics are in a different language, you can still feel the, the emotion that is being yeah. conveyed. You know I mean, you yeah. don't have. To... Oh, definitely. Yeah, especially good music. <laughs> yes, yes. There's only two. Kinds. So, what would be one of your favorite guitar riffs, Rusty? Um, like. My guitar riffs or somebody else's? Well, somebody else's that inspired you. Oh, yeah, man. Um, one of my all-time favorite guitar riffs is um, the the intro to Racer X's song Street Lethal. I love how... Paul, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, man, I love how Paul... Right. ...killer riffs and infused these fast runs. You know, that was that was part of the inspiration for the instrumental song um, called Under the Influence off my instrumental album. That, that song... Oh, cool. That song under the influence was my tribute to Ingve, Jason Becker, and Paul Gilbert, three of my biggest influences, hence under the influence. You know what I mean? Everybody always thought Oh, that's was, awesome. Yeah. Doing drugs is like, no, man, it's my guitar influences, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> right. Man, just about all of Paul's stuff, man. I, I love all of his riffs. Um, you know, a huge Dimebag Daryl fan, love all of his rhythms. You know, I don't I don't think I could just pick one, you know what I mean? Um, right. You know, there's those are all great. I don't think Dimebag could write a bad riff. You know, but yeah. Right, right. How do you how do you personally feel about the uh, reunion that they're doing, Rusty? Um, man, you know, I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't. It's a touchy situation. You know what I mean? I mean, I understand. Yeah. I know what Don, I know what Vinny's thoughts were before he passed away. You know what I mean? And I completely right completely understand that. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of like this, man, look at all the bands out there that only have like one original member in it. You know what I mean? True. You always, yeah. And you always wonder why, well, either somebody passed away or, you know, somebody couldn't get along. And these, these guys that, that are remaining in these famous bands, they, they will never have that fame that they had with that band again, because anytime you start something new, you're starting new. But if you come yeah. out with Leonard Skinner still, well, you still have that huge fan base. You know what I'm saying? Right. 
you come back yeah you're living on that name as a, a huge fan base if if uh you know phil and and uh rex and and um you know Zach and, and what is it, Charlie Bonatti? Is that who's right? Yeah, yeah, Charlie but yeah. From, from Anthrax. Those guys started a new band. I mean, it would have some momentum because of who they are, but they wouldn't be packing, you know, arenas and outdoor festivals because it's not Pantera. Right. So it would be a brand new thing. And that's one of the things I've learned the hard way in the music industry. It's like, it doesn't matter what you've done before. What you're doing now is brand new. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows what you're doing. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's like, it's boy, always an uphill climb. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my thing is this, I don't, I don't, I see why they're doing it and I can't really blame Charlie and Zach for taking part in it. But, um, you know, when, when like, uh, Phil Anselmo says they're doing it for Vinny and Diane, maybe, maybe they are, but, um, I don't think they would be doing it like if Vinny Paul was still alive because, um, when he was still alive, he was real adamant about not wanting to do it. And I, I guess when the brothers are both passed on, um, they're able to kind of do it now, you know. You know, I know, I know that Zach and uh, Dime were really good friends. So, you know, for Zach to do it, he must feel, you know, pretty yeah. good about. Dime yeah, yeah. It, you know what I mean? Otherwise, I don't think. True. You know. True. Yeah. So there, there must have been. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Rusty, is there is there any chance of uh, another album without World? Dude, I would love that. I would love it. I mean, I was. Yeah. Was so disappointed when Outworld, you know, broke up. Um, you know that band it was so talented. It's it's like, you know, it never got to see, never got the recognition that it deserved. Um, but yeah, man, I would love to. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I would love to. It'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Well, if the rest of the guys are watching this, uh, make it happen, man. That there was so much crazy talent in that band, and uh, I'm a hard person to please like that. Um, I don't just give those compliments out yeah, willy you. nilly ever. I hear you, brother. So, that. yeah, man, it was, it was, uh, yeah, that would be, that would be amazing to see. Yeah, it would be. Um, um, Rusty, I, I was curious if you ever, uh, I'm sure you have a, a guy of your caliber. Um, like, you ever get any offers to join other established bands? And, um, yeah, man, I have. Um, Guns N' Roses called me right before Outworld's first album was going to be released. Amazing. Wow. I, I can... <laughs> yeah, I know I've never really talked about it publicly. I know they're kind of yeah. weird camp, but I think it's been long enough that nobody's ever been. I mean, I mean, you you look at all the players they've had come in, in and out of the band since, you know, Slash was originally in the band, and um, they, they've all kind of stood out. They've been great players, different players. I mean, that's an interesting thing. Like, he didn't try to get a Slash, you know, carbon copy. Yeah, it's like I couldn't see myself playing Les Paul and wearing a top hat, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then Megadeth, um, when Chris Broderick left, he called me and I was going to do it. And then, you know, at the last minute, I decided it wasn't the best idea for me. It was, you know, it was a family related issue. And I thought, you know, I backed out politely. You know, but uh, that was that was very cool to get that phone call, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at one point, nevermore, uh, Jeff called me right after um, I had bought a new house. And it was like, dude, I just bought a house, man. I can't move to Seattle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you would have been a good fit in Nevermore, I think, Rusty. Yeah, that would have been a great gig. Man. Um, I would love to have done that. It would have been, I think that's probably would be one of the most opportune, you know, one of the best fits, you know what I mean? Um, it would have been uh, a band that would have, I would have really been able to contribute something to, you know? Yeah, and, and like you said. Um, yeah. Our world never broke out in a huge way, and yet um, the name Rusty um, Cooley means something, you know, in the guitar circles. But at the same time, why do you think that, like, you never got, you know, like all the guitar magazines wanting to put you on the cover and stuff? Well, you know, during that era, you know, I did get a lot of coverage. Um, yeah. Magazines and stuff like that all over the world, but uh, never on the cover of anything that big. But... Um, you know, I did get good exposure. You know, I was writing columns for Guitar Player Magazine and Premier Guitar and features and, you know, Young Guitar in Japan, Guitar Techniques yeah. in the UK and stuff like that. So it was it was pretty good, man. No covers. Well, I take that back. Here's the weird thing. I was the cover story on uh, an issue of Guitar Techniques Magazine, but they didn't put my picture on it. 
It was some generic guy and you couldn't see his head, you know. I think wow, that, wow. <laughs> that was the whole type oh, of lesson from blah blah, you know, six licks from hell or something like that. I don't know. But yeah. But was, was your guitar at least on the cover? <laughs> nope, man, it was some generic, you know, like wow. thing holding a guitar and you know they didn't show his head, so it was like this yeah. could be this could be you sort of thing. Um, I suppose. I don't know, man. But it, So what's the music scene like where you you're from in Texas? Is there much of a man? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, you know, honestly, I don't get out and hang out in the local music scene. You know what I mean? I don't, you know, I don't, I just don't go out to bars and hang out and watch music. I mean, as far as touring acts, there's definitely a lot of, we get a lot of good bands coming through, you know, touring artists, but, you know, the local music scene, yeah, man, I don't know too much about it. You know. are, there, are there any like up and coming players that you think are really, you know, kind of impressive that impress you? Um, new guitar players. Um, I think so, but I'm drawing blank right now. Let me yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll come back to that one. Yeah, okay, okay. How about how about the the, the guys um, that influenced you? You know, um, growing up. Yeah, sure, man. Uh, it, it started with uh, with Randy Rhodes. Randy Rhodes was uh, the first three years I played guitar. It was all Randy Rhodes, man. Yeah. Um, learned a ton of his solos and would practice along with the records and stuff. And, uh, and then I heard Ingve. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I was like, Oh shit. Just like, completely. Yeah, and you know what, it amazes me uh, when people tell me Randy Rose really influenced them. Um, there's no doubt how many people he influenced, but then there's a the fact that when you think about the fact that he only has got those two Aussie albums, that's his legacy. And yet look how many people he's influenced, you know, yeah. around the world. That is, it's it's pretty crazy. It's it's kind of like Zach said uh, in an interview. It's like Randy set the prefaces for everybody that came after him that was going to play guitar for Ozzy. You know, bare minimum. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, he had a great impact. Um, yeah, in fact, you you know when I when I interviewed Larry earlier this year from Hellstar, um, he was telling me he was such a Randy fan that any time that um, people see him in concert, he says. Um, Pay attention to the fact that I always play on stage left because that's where Randy played. Oh, nice, man. That's very cool, man. Yeah, I mean, Randy had an impact on me like as well. It's like anything that he was doing, I had to do. So he talks about classical music, so I started listening to classical music. I knew, found out that he taught guitar, so I wanted to teach guitar. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, everything just, you know, down to, you know, you know practicing and, and whatnot, you know, hearing stories about how after the gigs, he would go back to the rehearsal room or the dressing room and practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and he'd go to every town that he could stop in and try to get a local, a lesson from a local guitar instructor. He would go to it and end up being better than the teacher and then still pay for the lesson, you know. Yeah, so Rusty, um, before we wrap it up today, um, anything else you want to tell the folks um, that you're currently working on? Um, well, you know what, I've got a got some things that I'm working on, but I can't let out of the bag yet. So just the big thing is just to keep your eye out. You know, I've been real low key on social media for a while, um, but I'm getting ready to start ramping things up. Um, well, I'll tell you what, you're welcome back when you're ready to announce whatever it is. But I, what I, I will leave, I will um, close on this. I was very impressed with your official site. Of course, you're on Facebook, but I went to the fish and it is loaded with information for you not regularly updating it. You talking about my website? Yeah, I mean, it's got nice photos. It looks real flashy. A lot of times, you you go to somebody's official site and it has like maybe one or two photos, or it's not too updated. But but it at least tells your bio and gives people a little bit of a perspective on your career, which I think is really they want to know who Rusty Cooley is. That's the place I send them to. And you know, I, I think that's important. You know, I've done a lot of stuff, so I, I, it's important to to get out get that out there. So. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've interviewed a band or somebody and they tell me, oh, just take a picture off our Facebook page and you got one photo and it's not even the whole band or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. So it's like, if you look at the discography page, most people don't know I've been on about 40 albums now. Yeah. You know, that's... that's. Yeah. Uh, well, um, thanks again, Rusty. Um, it's going to cut us off and then we don't, we don't wrap this up, but thanks for doing this and we will definitely be in touch and have you back, okay, my buddy? Hey, man, it sounds great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Joe? Thanks bye a lot, bye. Rusty. All right, you rock, buddy.